well, I'm in London, as, um, same as you, I think. And yeah. uh, Craig is in uh, Australia. So, Down under. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Love you. It's raining here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. it's... Uh, it's a little bit warm in here. If I start sweating, uh, just forgive me. I had to close the window because of all the frogs outside. It's loud. <laughs> it could be anywhere. Yeah, God, it's like ridiculous. Come on, iPhone. This is just meant to be intuitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so weird. Um, ah, there you oh, go. There we go. That's, that's exactly what it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. amazing. And you yeah. said you were playing so we Chopin. I mean, Chopin is... Chopin. 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 <laughs> Chopin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's quite funny. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. That, yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's uh, yeah. Excuse my my uh, pronunciation. And uh, <laughs> how do you say it? Chopin. Funny. <laughs> Chopin. 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 So so anyway, like I, I mean, I, it sounds ignorant Chopin. of me, but I, but I have actually like listened to a lot of Chopin stuff. And when I was in um, <laughs> Warsaw. We went to a we went to an event where a lady was playing Chopin, nice. and it was just beautiful. So we're really looking forward to getting into oh, that. Thank you very much. Um, and thank yeah, they, they're, they're I, just yeah. I don't feel very cool. <laughs> no, but it's it's. I mean, it's amazing. Like we're reading this, and we're just fascinated to speak to you because there's so much interesting stuff in here that's so relevant these days. You know, like especially yeah. you know, the food side of things we want to talk about. Yeah. That that and, you know, like it, it's it's really up our alley. This stuff, but not just ours the people that uh, listen yeah. to the podcast too. Okay. So, so. Ooh, what's up, Gareth? <laughs> Great guys, how's it going, my man? How's your uh, Tuesday treating you, bud? Yeah, pretty awesome, my man. It's uh, Commonwealth Games here uh, on the Gold Coast and... Uh, we were expecting it to be crazy on the road, super busy, and it's actually been really quiet. But in preparation for it, we had shortened our hours at work, so uh, had a day off. So pretty awesome for a change of scenery. How about your day? Happy days. Yeah, mine's been really awesome. Uh, thanks, bud. So just a quick one. Have you been to any of the sports at the Commonwealth Games? <laughs> yeah, I went to watch some boxing. Uh, it was really awesome. I'm going to watch the Rugby Sevens on the weekend. Uh, and uh, didn't get to watch any of the athletics, unfortunately. But uh, it's been a it's been a good buzz, and uh, you know, there's people get a little bit into it, and it's pretty awesome just to see people like at their peak. It's just these athletes are incredible when you see them in real life. It's just on another level. It's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I I love watching uh, live sports, and um, it's a nice vibe being in a city when there's such a big event on. That's for sure. So. So yeah, what about um, what about you as a as a youngster? Were you quite an active guy? Did you play much? Did you do much sports? What was your childhood activities <laughs> like? <laughs> oh man, you know, I think you and I probably had similar upbringings. We similar age, grew up in South Africa, and one thing that was always on the cards was a good tree climbing. Uh, <laughs> get outside <laughs> and literally climb trees all day long and. Um, we used to also build forts. That was a common one. <laughs> yeah, that was good fun. <laughs> uh, but uh, climbing tree, and I, one or two of my mates had, had tree houses, basically a few, a few planks uh, put up in the tree somewhere. But that was just the most fun you could have all day long. And someone would, some of the, the, your friend's mom would bring out some biscuits and uh, some juice, oros, and then that would be your afternoon snack and you get back to tree climbing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, but oh, I, what do you mean? Yeah, yes. I also used to uh, used to love tree houses. One of my friends, his <laughs> uh, his his dad built him a, like an awesome one in his uh, one of his big trees in his in his garden, and it was just like so cool going over to his house. You know what I mean? You almost went <laughs> over to go play in the tree house and, and not necessarily to your mates <laughs> no i'm just joking oh, but but yeah no our, our guest this week uh, is a lady called uh, rosie millen and she actually grew up in oxfordshire in the uk and her dad built them mass a massive tree house in their backyard and yeah. uh, you can just sort of picture it like when she talks about it and it just sounds quite idyllic especially for a kid but what's also really kind of interesting is like, you know, how our lives these days have changed so much. And I know it's a natural progression of, you know, being an adult compared to being a kid. But 
it's weird. All adults these days, like, you know, I guess the ones that we are, are speaking to, everyone kind of seems to be so busy. Like, and we have to ask the question, like, why? Why are we so busy? You know, and mm. are we, have we kind of made like a, a bad decision that we kind of are so busy? Like, you know, um, but also I guess there's different types of busy. Like, how do you actually define it? Uh, like I know you and I, we spoke a lot about this. Like we, we talk about being busy, but we're actually busy with like cool stuff because we're learning. But then you have mm -hmm. other people that are really busy and they're just doing their corporate jobs and you ask them how they, they're doing and they're like, yeah, I'm so busy. Like I don't have yeah. any time for anything else. And you kind of wonder like, have we all got it kind of wrong? You know, why are we not... Mm making more time to just kind of enjoy ourselves and i don't know if it's just the result of the way the world is these days or, or what the story is and then off the mm. back of that you know there's there's a lot of byproducts you know that are quite negative especially stress and anxiety and fatigue and these are real common issues you know and rosie she talks about it in the chat with with us and she really suffered seriously badly from adrenal fatigue uh, where she was in bed for three years which is really 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 hectic and you know luckily for her she she basically spotted it because she was misdiagnosed initially wasn't she Craig yeah for sure it was just a, a really terrible and 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 so so tough on her and she she kind of toughed it out but inside she was struggling just to turn over in bed and, and just lead a normal life and I think it's really common unfortunately there's chronic fatigue adrenal fatigue and depression and these kinds of, of things are, are on the face of it fairly similar and people can get quite confused about them including doctors you know you could rock up at the doctor and and have some of these symptoms and like what happened with Rosie actually get misdiagnosed and perhaps be on some chronic medication uh, for the wrong thing. So it's really quite a tough sort of scenario to be in when, you, when you're when you feeling this way. But what happens is you can have stress and the stress builds little bit by little bit by little bit. And you think, oh, just, you know, stiff up a lip and get on with it. But that stress can actually physically start to affect your, yeah, your kidneys and your adrenal glands and your cortisol levels. And you can start to physically manifest this stuff really, really badly. And uh, you know, the first step is to get an opinion, uh, from a doctor if you're feeling this way, but it goes further than that. You need to get a second and a third opinion and you also then need to really do some serious research. And once you've put all of those together, you can sort of have an idea of, of where you're at. If you're looking for uh, a real good diagnosis, uh, and treatment plan, so it's trying to sort of amalgamate all the uh, things that you've researched and found out about and then with your doctors uh, get a unified sort of plan forward. But uh, it's really, really important to, to do the research yourself as well and listen to your own body uh, to some degree as well. Um, but not, not, no easy task by any means. Uh, and one of the ways of getting over these kinds of things is, is really – you know, talking about it because it's way more common than than people actually think. Hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, like you said, it's it's very common among people. But what we do as humans, which I think is you know quite common and a, not a good habit at all, is we we don't talk about things. You know, we we a lot of us are suffering from the same issues. You know, one of them might be like that you're seriously stressed out or you're really worrying about something or you're just very anxious about some upcoming event and but you don't necessarily say anything about it so therefore you you know you you sort of hold it in and it's kind of like really 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 builds up until you know you just can't take it anymore and then it just becomes like a much bigger event than it's sort of mm. ever been and, and you really suffer negatively for it. And I think the important lesson is that you and I have learned so far on all the podcasts that we've done is that if people just spoke more about how they were feeling, 
they would realize that there's so many other people out there that are feeling the exact same way. And that if you talk about it, you're not being weak, you know, you're, you're just actually being normal. And you might even help somebody else because they could be in the same boat. So being open is a really important thing and talking about it too. What yeah. do you think? For sure. And, and that's also why we, we're really so grateful to be able to have meaningful conversations with people like Rosie who share their um, massive amount of knowledge with us freely and she actually gives us quite a number of brilliant tips and some tricks and advice uh, for for this kind of thing and, and for these kind of uh, afflictions that people can end up with. So it's um, definitely time to take a listen to what makes Rosie Millen ridiculously human. Cool stuff. Uh, good morning, Rosie Millen um, from a... Morning cold well not really cold but from a rainy uh, morning in london um how's your day treating you so far so far so good i'm trying to be cheery even though it's a bit miserable like you say yeah but yesterday was an <laughs> awesome day yesterday was super good so i think i'm still feeling the benefits uh, was, it, was, was it awesome for a particular reason or just weather wise just, just lots of exciting things lots of good news like lots of gigs booked really exciting yeah nice. just stuff that makes me happy yeah, no, that's really, really cool. There's always something to be excited about if you if you're looking for it, hey. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So so yeah, the weather's been actually pretty average lately in London, hasn't it? It's just been like it's either freezing or it's rainy and <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah. Arctic or raining or quite warm. I think I think I just checked the weather and it's rain over Easter. Yeah. Which is kind of typical. I heard that you guys might have another snow snap there yeah. or something. Is that <laughs> I think there's a little bit of sleep coming tomorrow uh, or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, poor guys. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just close my eyes and, and springtime. Yeah. Oh, bad, isn't it? Yeah. It's crazy. All these people that talk about global warming, I'm like, no, no, you need to come live here for, for another winter <laughs> <laughs> and check it out. <laughs> oh, classic. So that's so cool that you had a great day yesterday. What does um, like a normal day for you kind of entail? So I'm usually heading to my workspace in the morning after the gym and I'll just be on my laptop working away, speaking to new customers, to new clients. I'm basically doing mostly public speaking at the moment. So my aim is to try and get into as many corporate companies as I can. So I work with somebody and we basically try and get, you know, corporate leads and convert them so that they book me. Um, so and then it's that's kind of in the morning and then the afternoon it's, it's meetings. So meeting people to work with, to do collaborations with, meeting new corporate clients, meeting new customers, just so that, you know, the business keeps growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's sort of a typical day. Okay, cool. And where is your workspace? It's in Chelsea at the moment. Oh, cool. Yeah. A place called Bluebird. I don't know if you know it. Uh, Bluebird. No, no, I haven't. Uh, is, it, is it like a more sort of small boutique kind of one? Yeah, it's kind of like a small boutique co-working space and they've got a restaurant there as well. Ah, oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. I'm yeah. A, yeah. I, I, there's quite a lot of them around London now, and they're really like great so places many. to work. Hey? Yeah, I know. So yeah. many. Yeah. Um, but it's so yeah. convenient, isn't it? And you've got everything you need there and probably it's save so on a better. few costs. And you're also interacting with other entrepreneurs. Yeah, so it's probably 100%. pretty cool. I mean, I've been running Miss Nutritionist for nearly 10 years now, and I hate working from home. And I know that sounds really kind of obnoxious. <laughs> when you've been doing it, for it's a really lonely place. And I find I'm so much more productive if I'm around people and I don't, because at home I feel like I get so many distractions, like I have a cat and the fridge <laughs> is there, so, <laughs> yeah. and I'll make like loads of cups of tea. But if I'm out in my office and everybody else around me is working, I just find I'm, I'm much sharper and much more productive and um, progressive. Yeah, totally. I can I can massively relate to that uh, because I actually quit my job uh, a year ago now and I've basically been sort of working from home for the last year and I find that mm. the biggest thing for me is the people. I miss the people. I miss their interaction. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah, I think the workspaces are great, um, you know, to sort of combat that. Yeah. I watched a podcast last night and she was basically saying that human beings need to feel connected. That's what we're here for. And so if we don't have that connectivity with other people, we're going to be really low and down and depressed and not springy and bouncy and happy. Yeah. So yeah, it's all about 
the connectedness and the community. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, like I, I mean, it's amazing. Like what people think uh, makes you healthy. You know what I mean? And it's it's not just going to the gym and eating properly. Yeah. There's so many other things to it. Definitely. Like you said, community is a huge one, and just getting outside and yeah. taking a relationship. Relationship yeah. key. If you've got toxic relationships, that can burn you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's because it, you are who you surround yourself with, so that's absolutely key to yeah. your happiness and your well-being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's 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 really interesting. Like I I was I was writing this week about something, and I was thinking, like, how important is it? Do you think to surround yourself by uh, people that uh, you know are going to push you and have the same thoughts as you? Um, okay, no, let me re- rephrase that. So, like, it is important to the, to have people that are on the same wavelength as you. Um, mm. But I also think it's quite important to have some people who are, you know, maybe not on the same wavelength and you yeah. know, have a very different perspective um, and also maybe are, you know, dare I say it's even on the kind of negative side because you can kind of learn from them and you go, you know what, I never actually want to be like that. So it's good to be aware Ooh, of that. Do you know good what? question. Yeah. Yeah, having that balance because people love diversity. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but I know a lot of negative people and I choose to, like, I'm so positive. It literally is black and white for me now. So if I'm around a negative person, I just, I feel really funny because it's so different to who I am. So I get what you're saying. I think what we need is somebody who can push us to the edge of our comfort zone so that we are growing and developing. But I think what we might need on the flip side is people who are a bit calmer so that we're not consistently go, 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 like a mm. freight train. Yeah. So I, I get that. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think there's also an aspect like p- potentially instead of an, someone that's maybe negative, I get what you're saying as well. You get to relativize a little bit uh, around that. But if you have a, a person that is close to you that can play devil's advocate and can use their, their, their smarts to kind of uh, – sort of play that role but actually not be that kind of person i guess then that would be almost as beneficial you know and and still create that same result for you ultimately you know mm. but I, I i think you're right i think we we need a degree of lots of different types of characters around us to thrive in all areas yeah absolutely sure. yeah yeah Cool. So, um, yeah. so yeah. So, just, uh, just I guess to give the the chat a little bit of context, um, I started following you on Instagram, and and it's because I don't know, I don't know, someone, someone I know was like following you as well, and I was like, ah, oh, that's cool. And then, uh, you know, I was like, and then I started like seeing your story, and your story was like really, really amazing. I was like, we we really need to to speak to you and and have you on the podcast. So, thank you very much for you know for coming on as a guest. Um, we're really looking forward to this chat. Um, and and part of the you know part of our podcast and what we like to do is we like to draw out the human element of it you know and all of us have stories mm. and all of us actually have really interesting things to speak about that so many people can relate to so you know just to kind of help us like get to know you a little bit um if we can just kind of take it back um you know from when you were you were a child uh, we know that you you know you're born in oxford and you know you have uh, you know you have actually three other siblings um yeah yeah, w- w- one of the interesting things actually is, sorry, before I, I let you go, is um, you, you are a twin and you, you're actually, I think, the the third or fourth yeah. twin or fourth twin that we've had on the podcast, which is crazy because we've only ha- we've had less than 30 episodes. And then the other interesting thing is that um, my girlfriend is a twin. Craig's girlfriend is a twin. So it's like, wow. it's just, so we like surrounded. <laughs> <What? laughs> Guys, there's loads of twins. Yeah, wow. But it's it's the best thing ever. It's the best thing. I'm so lucky to to be born into this world with a twin. You know, out of no force of my own, I just came to this world like that, and it's just the best thing ever. Yeah. So we're super lucky. Yeah, that's cool. And you guys so, are identical, is that right? Yeah, we're genetically identical, which means we're split from the same egg, but we're totally different. <laughs> <laughs> and the more we grow up, the different we are. But it's nice because I always think. You know, what she has, I don't have. And what I have, she doesn't have. So together we're like one complete person. And my my mum told me when we were growing up, if we were exactly the same, we'd probably not get on and we'd be more competitive with each other. Whereas because we're different, we actually complement each other. So I totally agree with that. 
Yeah. And is, is, are you guys like, were you growing up? I know a lot of twins have this phase where it's kind of, it is kind of difficult and then you become like closer or have you always been kind of close? Nah, and we've good always mates? been literally, we've been so close because being a twin, it's an undeniable bond. It's, it's there from the start and I think it grows and grows. It's, it's always going to be there. So yeah, I think we've only ever argued and fallen out like twice in our lives. Wow. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. That's impressive. <laughs> and one of them, one of them was over a cat. <laughs> so really stupid, like babysitting my cat when I was away. She, it, it got really ugly. But anyway. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> we won't go there. Yeah. Water under the bridge now. Water under the bridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's another cat. We got rid of that cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so uh, you know, what was it like growing up? Um, you know, in your, with your family up in Oxford. It was absolutely amazing. It was really a very humble upbringing. Um, Oxford is a beautiful place to be born and be brought up in. Um, it was a very happy home. You know, I've got, I've obviously got an identical twin sister. I have an older sister and an older brother. So in a way, it was a very complete family. Um, and we're ext- we were extremely close and we're still very close now. You know, every single night we would sit down around the t- dinner table and have dinner together You know, we would even have breakfasts together and lunches together at the weekends. And that was literally a really strict family system that we would adhere to every single day for like at least 15 years. Um, So, yeah. um, uh, What? Yeah. What else can I say? Just a very, very humble, happy, you know, really good upbringing. Yeah. Pretty strong. That's so cool. Yeah. Do you you think that's an important aspect, um, you know, in terms of family dynamics to to sort of force that issue a little bit when, when your kids are young to say, let, you know, let's all hang out together, have Absolutely. dinners together. And of course. That, yeah. You've only got your family, right? You know, people come and go, but you've only got, ever got your family. And again, my mother, she's always said to us, no matter what happens in this world, I want you guys to make sure that you stick together. Don't ever fall out. You can work it out. Um, and that really, you know, that's really struck a chord with us from, you know, from when she started to say that even to this day. And we all, we've got this WhatsApp group, we all chat on it and we have jokes and we get together <laughs> every month. And and I actually feel sorry for the people that don't have that. I've met a lot of people yeah. who have broken families, broken relationships with their parents, so many, especially in London. And I feel, I feel really sorry for them. And but there's not much you can do. And I just feel kind of so grateful, but almost guilty to the point where I'm so lucky that I've had that and they, they don't. Yeah. You know, you almost feel borderline guilty when you've got it all right from a family point of view. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Be, I mean, it's it's quite alarming the the number of people that come from broken families. It's it's almost. I totally it, agree. It's almost yeah. like fifty percent or something crazy. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, but you're right. It's it's so important. I think it's really integral to who you are. I mean, I definitely um, credit my father for who I am today. Um, he was very philosophical. And introduced me to all these books. I remember the, the first book he introduced me to was Sophie's World. Okay, I don't know yeah. if you guys have heard of that. Yeah. It's very, it's it's very all about how we think and why we're here. And and he really opened my eyes to all of that. And uh, I definitely credit him for a, a lot of who I am today and the way that I think. And we're very alike. So every time I'm a bit stuck on something or I get upset or I feel vulnerable or confused about the world, I'll give him a call and I'll be like, what do you think? And, <laughs> you know, why am I feeling like this? And what do you think I should be thinking and feeling? He's, he's, he's a genius. I mean, he's very pragmatic and, you know, he went to Oxford University. So luckily I've got somebody who I can get all the answers from. <laughs> credible uh, credible yeah. laugh, uh, ex- yeah. existential so uh, advice. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. So, but again, really solid and um, so grateful. I, they always so pick what me did, up whenever I speak to them. What did mum and do, dad do? What, what was their... Bless them, they're retired now. Um, uh-huh. I think they're, they're over 70. Um, but they just do, um, for the past couple of years, they've been building up homes like properties and renting them out. So so they built a villa in Portugal and they rent that out to holiday makers. They're cool. building one in France. And I think they're going to start to rent that out. But they're really just retired. They're, but a lot of the time before their early, because they've only just retired now, but they were doing property and rentals and that kind of thing. Yeah. Nice. Were they, were they, okay. Is that what they did their whole life basically? Or were they working as uh, like a profession before? That, that? was... 
that no they were doing that and my father was working in hospitals he was like doing all of the IT in hospitals up and down the UK and my mother was a research um, there's a company called Elsevier Science which is a massive ah. medica- um, publication for all scientific studies yeah so she was like basically running that for a very very long time wow. when I was a child um, and then she re- she started helping my father do the rentals and then recently they've they've retired so yeah nice. ah, cool. yeah cool yeah I've actually come across Elsevier they they yeah. There's there's a, some books called War Grant or something like that, like they uh, like anatomy and physiology and things like that, and they they, they the Elsevier is like the online part of it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they basically publish thousands of scientific studies every month or something like that. Wow. But that yeah, she worked there. That was back in Oxford, yeah. um, but they've since moved to the Isle of Wight now. So. Ah. quite a life for them yeah (laughs) that's cool it's kind of what we all dream of isn't it yeah yeah they're living the dream (laughs) (laughs) and And so your brett and your brett your sister now what this you know your twin sister obviously i always find like nature versus nurture a very very interesting sort of subject Mm -hmm. you know um same genetics different people so like what what was the difference? So, so what sort of path has, has she taken? Boyfriends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had totally different boyfriends. When we first, we, we basically moved from Oxford to London together. We had completely different tastes in guys anyway, but I met a guy and I dated him for 10 years. Wow. And he, wow. he like, I moved in with him and he was much older than me. And, you know, we went around the world together. We traveled around the world. We were very lucky to be able to do that. And uh, he was very influential on me and how I thought, and, you know, how I experienced the world. And she didn't have that. You know, she went traveling and started working on, you know, on cruise ships. She was a dancer. I was doing nutrition. So I think that whole, um, you know, we started to become quite different because of things that we started to experience. So, yeah. yeah and she was on and off. She had loads of different relationships with different guys. She couldn't find the right guy. And um yeah so boyfriends was one of them <laughs> but careers careers you know um I don't really know why to be honest with you what the real root cause of why we're so different even though we're genetically identical but um yeah I think I think that her just her career my career the people that we met those were the sorts of things that have, have made us slightly different today no, that's yeah. really yeah. cool and uh yeah, you uh, you have some cool uh, memories uh, growing up. Um, you know, one of them which I <laughs> I, I really I really like yeah. is, is the massive tree house which your your dad oh, built yeah. to you in your house. Oh, how cool yeah, is that? That's so awesome! And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Like oh, it wow. started off as a tiny hut, literally at the back of our garden, in the trees at the back that surrounded the garden, and then it led on to like loads and loads of fields. But so my dad built this tiny tree house. And then it was really cool because nobody had one and my neighbors would always come over. <laughs> and then my father's, bless him, he's, he's very much a handyman. He loves building stuff, especially with wood. Yeah. So he just cut down the other trees next to it and build like a longer tree house. And then he was just literally mm. like, sod it. We'll just cut down all of the trees that lined the whole of the garden. And it just literally <laughs> went all the way around. No so way. Had this massive, wow. Yeah. And you could run. All, it was like wow. um, you know, an, a... a a course you could just run all the way and you could hide in different parts and there were steps up steps best. down it was honestly the best and uh, all wow. our neighbors wanted to come and run around in it yes. and hide in it it was, it was really unique right it was the biggest tree house in oh. oxford yeah it sounds like <laughs> peter <laughs> yeah, pan amazing. like it's just amazing yeah it almost was it almost was so we had the best time playing in that tree house and then we would uh, fall into the fields at the back as well and play hide and seek and we would roll these massive haystacks and push them all into the center of the field and build homes. And then the farmers would come in their tractors and like literally be so angry and we would bolt and hide in the treehouse. <laughs> we would literally, and they would be like, we can see you and shout at us in the fields. And we would be like hiding in the treehouse going like, ah. you know, so really fun, silly things, but yeah, so much fun. Your dad, the, the treehouse is still your dad's <laughs> private, uh, proudest um property that he's uh, developed in uh... <laughs> uh yeah bless i mean that that he's so creative they've had they've developed and built some amazing properties since then but 
yeah, I, I'll ask him. I'll find out if the treehouse is his, <laughs> is his work of art. You know, it's uh, his masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. Did, is it? Is do they still own that house, or did you have? To, no, is, oh. no. That was that was the childhood house in Oxford. That was where we were all brought up. But no, we sold that a very long time ago. I think about fifteen years ago now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would, yeah. Have been, it would have been sad to have given the treehouse up, that's for sure, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, it was sad. But we were moving on to new and exciting things, and then we built another. they built another house in Oxford, and uh, that was absolutely stunning. And then they sold that one and then went to Portugal and started doing the whole villa rental thing there. Cool. Um, so, yes, really lovely homes. Very, very, you know, not, um, not uh, palace-like by any means, but just really... Um, country-ish and, and um, safe and comfortable. Yeah, nice. nice and homely. Exactly, yeah, very, very homely. Yeah. I haven't been to, to Oxford, but it just all those sort of adjectives that you just use, they sort of, when I picture Oxford, it conjures up exactly those kind of things, leafy, Aww. beautiful, I don't know, it's always the, the vision that I've had of it, it just seems yeah. exactly like that. It is beautiful. It's a stunning city. And obviously you've got all the um, universities and Harry Potter was filmed there. So you should try and go. Yeah. <laughs> you get a chance. Whether you're in, whether you're heading over this, this side of the world. Yeah, Good exactly. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you, you're very musical and, yes. you know, you, geez, you, you've achieved some great, amazing grades when it comes to, you know, to musical instruments, violin and piano. Uh, so, so did that, that started at quite a, a young age, I'm sure. I mean, it can only have started at a young age to get yeah. the sort of grades you did. I, to be honest, I think I started playing the piano and the violin at the same time. Wow. I must have been about, I, it was so early, like five years old. Wow. Um, and I, I'll let you into the secret. I, um, <laughs> I hated both of them in the beginning. I <laughs> tested the violin. Wow. <laughs> it's a very difficult instrument to play. It's so hard. And yeah. I, I actually, to this day, don't know how the hell I got up to grade eight. <laughs> like, I didn't do any practice, you know. And uh, at one point, I, I think I told you uh, in the questions, but basically I hated the violin so much. My mum made me tour. She, she made me join this orchestra and I would tour the world and we would go to Prague with this orchestra. And I hated it. I hated all the people. I hated the pieces. Um, and one uh, one day we had a concert in Oxford with the orchestra and I really, really didn't want to play. So what I did was I deliberately left my violin at home. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to outsmart my mum. And we got oh. there. She was like, Rosie, where's your violin? I was like, oh, I think I left I it at home. It. So <laughs> yeah, like, I'm bad. She was so angry. She literally made me sit in the orchestra and everybody was playing around me, and I was just sitting there, not playing. Oh my goodness! Looking like a complete idiot. Just, I just felt like I was so humiliated. I just felt like the biggest idiot, <laughs> sitting amongst all these, you know, this massive orchestra, and I was the only one not doing anything. It was so. Did a massive you lesson. like kind of try and act like you were doing something, or did you just literally no, just I just, sit there? I literally looked like the biggest <laughs> sheep. There was just no way of redeeming myself. I just, okay. I just had to sit through it. Um, oh. Yeah, I remember it feeling so unbearable, but I, I literally walked out and I went up to my mum and I said, I'm sorry, I'm never doing that again. And I, <laughs> I started to play. I literally started to play ball after that. I went to my lessons. I would, I would oh. practice. Yeah, yeah. So She made her point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I love the piano and I actually still play the piano now. I, I've stopped, I, I stopped playing the violin. It's, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I love the piano because for me, the piano is very meditative. I use it to escape pretty much every night when I come home or not every night, but I try to do an hour every night. Um, wow. And now I'm putting on this concert. So I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm um, raising money for the great Ormond street hospital, oh, wow. um, which is um, a charity for sick children here in London. And I now, because I'm better and because I've got my energy back this year is all about giving back. So I thought to myself, what can I do to you know do something good you know and be be charitable so I found this um, organization and I thought the only thing I can do really is play the piano so I thought I'll put on a concert um, in the Steinway Hall here in London and just do an evening of Chopin because I can only play classical music so I thought I'll ask a couple of my other friends if they want to join in so we can do like a mini concert so it's a Chopin soiree 
and it's on May the 9th and we're basically playing um, eight pieces of Chopin and we're going to sell tickets and raise money for charity. So we've already raised about £2,000 wow, and we're trying to raise 5000 maybe some more. But the idea is all that money is going to go towards children with chronic fatigue and ME and it's going towards um, specifically mitochondrial support which is basically the, the mitochondria is the cell. It's, it's kind of like the factory in every single cell in your body. And it basically generates something called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Yeah. And that is your yeah. body's energy molecule. It's, it's like your body's energy molecule. So the money is going towards specifically research for mitochondrial repair because they have um, identified that everybody with ME and chronic fatigue have mitochondrial deficiencies. So... Wow. Yeah, really, it's really amazing. I'm I'm so excited to be part of it and giving back, and it's just it's such a different feeling. Yeah, um, but it's yeah. very very rewarding. It's so and nice just, to yeah. be to be providing value, isn't it? And uh, like I said, yeah, to just giving back and 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 yeah. just to see a smile on the kid's face, and you know, for them to but, see that someone's taking interest in them. Yeah, but I think to be honest, it's really nice to put energy into something that isn't for your benefit. Of course. So it's something completely that's not work related that's not self-centered it's not selfish it's something completely selfless and it brings you a, a, a greater deeper level of satisfaction yeah so i'm absolutely bricking it by the way i'm gonna be so scared because <laughs> again i've actually never performed in a piano concert i've obviously done wow. orchestra with a violin but i've never ever done a concert but i'm just like you know what it's got to be done and uh great things don't come from comfort zones yeah. so yeah awesome. <laughs> i'm embracing it I'm really looking forward to it, but I'm absolutely going to be petrified. It's got to be done. <laughs> so is this sort of, this was off the back of, of you know, ideas of that you had that you specifically put together and, and then you round up or rounded up yeah. a bunch of mates that were also sort of musos and, and you've put yeah. it all together. I think it's a really valuable um, cause because as far as I understand, in E is or not that long ago wasn't even a real thing in inverted commas. Yeah. Um, and so to do more, I think a lot more research is needed so that it's not just um, our, you know, harden up kind of thing, which obviously yeah. we'll get into the, the, the details of what goes on there. But I think, um, you know, these kind of uh, afflictions are so tough for, for especially youngsters. I mean, they like what they must be so hard to understand what's wrong. And I think oh, that kind exactly. of research is super I mean, valuable. So, well, that's exactly why I chose this charity. I mean, I know what it's like to have no energy. And oh, my God. I really struggled and it was it was literally the hardest thing I've ever had to do and I, I really believe that nothing is going to be as hard as that so bless these children you know they're they're so young you know some of them as young as five even younger and they've got this uh -huh. condition where they're bed bound and it, it literally brings you to tears because you're just like I'm an adult but I like to think that I can think about how I'm going to get energized again and and you know but these children they just started that way and it's just it's unbearable so that's why you know, how can you not do something to help? Yeah. You know, yeah. Them. they must be so frightened. They must be so scared and they don't know any other life. So, yeah, I think that probably I'll, I'll be doing this as a regular thing. That's really cool. So if people yeah. like wanted to support nice. that, do they, they just get tickets to it? Is there any other um, way? Um, tickets are predominantly just for friends and family. Um, there's only 50 seats in the audience. But if they wanted to find out more, about the charity, we, we're open for donations. It's on my Just Giving page. Shall I send you guys the link for that, and you can? Yeah, we, yeah. We, how would that work? Yeah, we we put uh, we write a lot of show notes and stuff, and we put okay. all the stuff in the show notes. So I, I, I'll find it, or I'll get it from you, and I'll put it in there. Yeah, I think it's JustGiving.co.uk forward slash Miss Nutritionist. Okay, but I'll I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. Okay, that's thanks. Awesome. Brilliant, thanks. That sounds cool. And and. Okay, cool. So, like, an, another childhood sort of um, uh, venture, I guess, of yours was that you and your sister, I think you and your sister both modeled. Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, you, you did, like, lots of uh, commercials and stuff. And then one of the things which was really uh, quite funny for us was you wrote here that you, you and your sister would leverage the fact that you are identical Definitely. twins. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or what, can you yeah, it's a, it's tell a, us about Yeah, that? I mean, it's a gift. It's a gift. It's kind of like, in a way, it's a USP. So when you're <laughs> approaching these modeling agencies, it's like, oh, you've got a twin sister. Great, we can put you forward for all these other things. Uh -huh. So 
Um, and we would leverage it. We would just be like, what else can we do to um, really dine out on the fact that we're twins? So, you know, the commercials was a big, big thing. You know, we would go up for castings for a Tesco's commercial and it would be like £10,000 each. Wow. And that would wow. be just a couple of hours work for the day. Crazy. So wow. that's, why we, that's why we would leverage it. We would be like, what else can we do? What other jobs can we do? Because that was our main source of income when we're, we were just students, right? She was studying dance I was studying drama and we would go to loads of castings we would call up all these modeling agencies and we'd be like look can you put us forward for these jobs and they started to do that and we just saw the power in it there was a lot of power in being a twin and um you know we we got jobs we did commercials for Dove for Vodafone for Canon um it was really fun it was it was very hit and miss sometimes you know we'd go for these big jobs and we'd really want them and you would never get the ones that you wanted right and there was a lot of competition (laughs) But yeah, we would just try and leverage it as much as possible. And we would turn up, you know, we would literally wear the same makeup, wear the same, have the same clothes. We would, I remember we were both bought these hideous bright green cardigans so that we would stand out. And we would always That's have to clever. plan what we were wearing. We have to get like pictures for the portfolio and we were constantly taking photos and updating our portfolio and sending out our pictures to everybody. And yeah, it was a really interesting time. And it was great to spend all that time with her. But it was, it was tough. It did come with its challenges. Um, there was a lot of competition. We wouldn't always get the jobs. And, you, you know, the money was good. And then you would have to wait to get paid because the modeling agency would pay you in, like, 60 days' time. And, but we were lucky. We, we met some cool people. We traveled the world. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. You traveled well, the world? It's one... Yeah, we did. Yeah. Oh, wow. But we, we realized after a certain age, you know, there's more to life than just these odd modeling jobs and it's it doesn't really have a strong sense of purpose and you know I actually stopped doing it because Susie left and she got a job in Hong Kong she started um, a spin instructor career and uh, she's absolutely smashing it now and she's really passionate about the fitness industry Um, and same for me you know we I started doing nutrition at the end of doing all that modeling because I basically had no energy when I was growing up, you know, when, when we were, when I was at university and when we were doing all these modeling shows and all these shoots and things, my energy was rubbish. You know, I would, I remember floating around from casting to casting, from lecture to lecture. And, um, I decided to just figure, you know, change something because it was really annoying me. So I embarked on a small nutritional therapy course, like, you know, one of those home study courses. Yeah. It's literally just like a home schooling thing for a year. And that was really the start of my career because I was totally blown away by the power of food as medicine. And, um, I, and I just thought, wow, this is so amazing. This is what I've been put on the planet for. This is my purpose. So I stopped doing all the modeling and all the commercial stuff and started doing nutrition. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so after that, I naturally went to do a, a longer course. I did a nutritional therapy diplo- diploma and that was four years. And that was 10 years ago now, but literally wow. the minute I graduated, I set up Miss Nutritionist. I, I, the day I got my certificate, I was seeing clients. I had my website up and running. Wow. I had a business coach because I was so serious. I was so passionate. And I, I'm, I'm very much a doer. Like I'll go, I'm a very much, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm very ambitious. I'm a go-getter. And so I literally did everything I could in order to get my business off the ground. Yeah. So that's how it all and started. And how old were you when you, when you finished that course? Uh, 19, oh, wow. 20, something like that, 21. I've got a terrible so you, memory. So you already, you'd already <laughs> had this, the, the wherewithal to kind of say, this is what I'm going to do. I want to start a business and wow, that's it, amazing. I, it was literally an epiphany that moment. And I, I, I was actually with my sister and my family at the time. And I was like, you know what guys, I love nutrition. I think I'm going to make it a career. And my, I remember my father being there. And uh, it was it was just our, that moment in the living room. We just had an epiphany. <laughs> Susie and I both actually, and we literally decided to stop the modelling because it was wow. it got a bit destructive in the end. That whole not having work and then going long periods of time with you know not, not much cash flow, and yeah. so we were like, let's put a stop to this. I'm going to do nutrition. Susie's going to do fitness, and we haven't looked back. Wow, that's super yeah. cool. And. Uh, yeah. And and what was your I get like a couple of things like what was your eating like um, while you're doing the the sort of modeling because if you were low energy was it like a typical 
model kind of diet where you yeah. eat as little as you it can so you can stay as <laughs> skinny as you can you know what I mean um yeah yeah it wasn't very healthy at all it was it was pretty rubbish and this was pre-nutrition by the way so I didn't have a clue what I was doing like most people yeah so I was I was yeah I definitely wasn't eating enough it wasn't really intentional but obviously being a model you've got a your body is your commodity so you have to look the part so yeah I definitely wasn't eating enough I was probably over exercising and borderline um counting the calories you know the usual what a teenager would do when you're a bit clueless and you want to look good um yeah. yeah so it wasn't it wasn't it definitely wasn't what it is now no way and did did you feel like at that stage did you have any like body pressure and stuff did you notice that yeah. or was it kind of like yeah, nah, I just no, got on with quite, it no there was, it was definitely um prevalent um you know because there's a comparative world when you're up for castings and you're going up against hundreds and hundreds of people you, you know and you're under a lot of scrutiny so yeah there was a pressure to look good um be the best looking twin or be the most identical looking twin and have the best clothes and you know, so that you would get the job. So definitely, yeah. And I think we fell, we fell under that pressure. Me much more than my sister. My sister took it with a pinch of salt, but I fell under it a little bit harder than she did. Yeah. 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 Is, isn't it quite like? I mean, it's kind of sad in a way, like how important aesthetics is in our lives these days. You know, and like people, people basically judge you on how you look, and it's literally like. It's, you know, it's just, yeah. it's not really the way it should be. Um, no, but it's actually getting worse. Yeah. Thanks to the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. is crazy. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. just posting yeah. these photos of them looking amazing and, and you know, they, they, they'll they'll take like, like do like a photo shoot, you know, of like 60 different photos and then they'll they'll post them like over time and people will get the wrong impression. They'll think, okay, this person is always in shape. It's incredible. But the reality is, is that no one looks like that all the time. And um, it's, yeah. it's so funny. I was actually in the gym last night and I was running on the treadmill and this thought crossed my mind, which was this gym is really busy and we're all young. We all look the same. We all look fit and healthy. And I was like, I wonder how much Instagram has to answer for <laughs> people being here. Wow. Because nobody ever used to be in the gym, right? It wasn't really like a done thing across the board. People were not that health conscious. Nobody really signed up to the gym. They were normally quite empty. And there were certainly no boutique gyms around. And I'm like, how much has Instagram got to answer for all of this? Uh Are we all here because we have to look good now because Instagram is so prevalent in in, in today's society? And I was like, how much has it got to answer for? I I just thought suddenly crossed my mind. Yeah, that is a good good question. I think it's not only the the fact of looking good that that prompts people, but... If if you look at like suggestions and whatever you on like a lot of those um, sort of explore part of the Instagram is going to be people in the gym like hitting the gym hard and it's just so normal to see gym stuff like yeah. people doing certain exercises at the gym and yeah. and totally it's like I, I hadn't even thought of that until you said it now like you just see it mm. all the time and even if it's I'm not particularly like worried that. about how they look yeah yeah exactly like so just- so different. Post after post. So, so yeah, like, uh, just I guess while we're on the exercise thing, you, you actually were quite were, were you quite big into your gymnastics when you were growing up? Because you know you said massively, that, yeah, yeah. I love gymnastics. I was just obsessed. I don't know what it was. I think it's because I'm so fascinated with how the body works, and you know when you're doing all those tumbles and the backflips, I'm just like wow by that kind of stuff. So I signed up straight away as soon as I could. And uh, I, I joined with my twin sister and we, we would go together. I think it was every Thursday night to our local gym uh, class in Oxford. And I just, I, I really excelled actually because, you know, when you're so passionate about something, it just, you naturally grow. So, yeah, I loved the floor. I loved, I love a challenge. So learning how to do really challenging moves was something that I just wanted to do again and again. And I'm, I get quite obsessed with things. So if I wanted to achieve a backflip, like there was no way I was going to stop that night until I got there. Wow. Um, wow. So, and I would just practice, 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 practice. Um, yeah, and I absolutely loved it. So we did loads of competitions. And then I, on my last competition, I came first on the floor, on the vault, 
and on the beam and overall wow. and I won the shift wow. and I was just like this is amazing and uh I was <laughs> absolutely I, I loved it so much I was so obsessed yeah and, and and did you stop it for any particular reason I think with that kind of sport you stop after you're a teenager because your body changes you're not so flexible you know when your hormones break break and and you know um, things change and uh, yeah you, you also grow and you get taller and you're not able to do all the nippy things on the bar and the beam so yeah it was an it was a natural um, stop because yeah you just grow up you grow out of it right you, yeah. you don't nobody does gymnastics after the age of about 18 20 right so yeah I was sad but um, just yeah it was just a natural um, decline yeah yeah um, did you we had a we had a lady on uh, one of our previous podcasts who uh jesse mandel who, who basically was big into her gymnastics as well but she also like opened our eyes to the fact that there was a lot of like sort of misinformation to the gymnasts and the way that they trained and a lot of the youngsters and uh and then ultimately the getting older, the people ended up with sort of injuries. Did you have any like injuries growing up? Oh, Were you nothing word. like that? Touch wood. Never broken a bone in my body. Nothing. <laughs> wow. No. I just had adrenal fatigue for three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That you replaced it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lucky. No. Nothing. And, okay, great. And, and yeah. these days, like, uh, can you still do handstands and stuff pretty easily? Yeah. Or... Just I can do cartwheels and handstands just about, but Man, if I try to do backflip, I think I'd break my back. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I just find it fascinating, um, you know, when you see all these people. Even on Instagram, again, there's loads of videos of all these yeah. gymnasts doing crazy stuff. And I'm just, I literally could watch it all day. Yeah. I just find it wow. mesmerizing, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. We, it's we... the Commonwealth Games here at, at uh, uh -huh. next, end of next week that's starting. And I was, yeah, actually... Uh, like only after the fact I realized like I'd really like to watch the gym gymnastics because mm. it would just you know, like you say it's you uh, mind like a body like mine I can't just fathom how that stuff is even possible Absolutely. exactly and you guys put your body through the paces and it's it really is like just incredible to see so mm. I hope I get to to watch some of that live you know to see the see the guys and girls yeah. do their thing in the rings and the whatever else be amazing yeah, yeah that would be amazing yeah, yeah. it's amazing how easy they make it look as well you yeah. just like you're like they yeah. make it look so it. yeah you're mm -hmm. like oh i can do that because they make it look so easy <laughs> true, and then yeah. you go and you try and you're like oh no i can't actually yeah, do that head. yeah <laughs> feel gravity is like gravity is a real thing when you try yeah. and use <laughs> yeah totally like 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 i've been practicing not pra yeah definitely practicing recently. Like, trying to just lift my whole body off the ground like if i'm sitting like straight legs oh yeah and like that's tough. I like, I'm like, how do you guys do this? Like, yeah. you just make it look so easy, dude. It's like, it's not. <laughs> uh, when they're in the funny. rings, when they like, how do you get yes. your arms oh. straight and your body straight on? Like, I don't picture, I can't even imagine how the physics works on that. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is really amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so Rosie, sorry, just uh, before we actually move on um, to, you know, to the, the nutrition side of things and, and to your, your fatigue. Um, so so I, I just want to find out quickly a little bit about the, uh, the grades in music, right? So mm. you're a grade eight violinist and a grade six pianist. Like, I mean, th that is really, really high, um, you know, fir first of all. So, wow. I mean, we'd love to hear, hear that. That's for sure. Um, some of your music. <laughs> But like, what do the different grades actually mean? Like, how do you, you know, differentiate between the two and how do you progress up them? That's a really good question. How do they differentiate? Well, they obviously start off really easy um, and they get harder and harder as you go. Like, um, I'm not sure how it works anymore because I haven't done it for a very long time. But in your, you basically work towards an exam and then you pass the exam and then you work towards the next exam. And you pass that exam. So it's grade one exam, yeah. grade two exam, grade three. So so grade eight basically means exam eight, right? Yeah. Um, but you have to learn three pieces for each grade. And the pieces that you need to learn for each grade and you get marked on, they get significantly harder and harder. Okay. So same with the sight reading, same with the 
there's an oral test. They every single exam is the same, but just the the pieces and the things that you're learning and playing get more and more advanced. Okay, cool, cool. That's, that's how yeah. it's. Good. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And so, yeah. so there's like different elements to it. There's like yeah. written, oral, playing, yeah. etc. Um, yeah, sight reading. Wow. Yeah. And any scales, arpeggios. You're basically wow. tested in all, all of the techniques. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then you get you basically pass or fail. And and is there any like history involved too? Like, do you have to learn the history of music or anything like that? Gosh, good question. Not from the grades for an instrument. Yeah. Not I didn't. I don't yeah. know if it's changed now, but no, I didn't. No. Uh, okay. You're not tested on history. No, you're not tested on where Chopin was born. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Should be. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what is the pinnacle? No. What is the what is the ultimate like? Is there is there a place that you can reach and go? That is it, or how does it work? Like, what is the ultimate grade? Yeah, I know that's what I think. It's grade eight. Grade eight is the highest. Oh, it's the highest. Oh hmm. wow. Oh wow. Okay. Gee. Whiz. I mean, it might have changed because I haven't. Done no, no, it so no. Long. I mean, I think it's still the same. Grade eight is the highest. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, wow. and then you just go on and perform. Wow. Like oh. Lang Lang. Do you guys know who Lang Lang is? No, I don't actually. Although the oh. name is quite familiar. Amazing. Does sound. Yeah. He's like the best pianist in the world. Oh, okay. Apparently, he's, he's so amazing. He's inspired 40 million children to take up the piano. What? Are staggering. Wow. He's wee. incredible. Wow. So that then, I mean, obviously, he's grade eight, but he's beyond, right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. Check him we're out. all the Who's same here. Yeah, I've also got a grade eight. <laughs> yeah, so. Not all pianists are created equal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if not you all grade eighters. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you want to play like in an orchestra, do you have to be a certain grade? Yeah, I mean, you do auditions, but yeah, they won't take you unless you've done grade eight. Jeepers, okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah, Very for sure. And and is it like um, like karate or one of those martial arts where it's almost? I think some of them are like age based too, so you can only go to a certain level once you're a certain age. Right. Or is it no? Not at all. And that's why you see such young kids, like on YouTube, they're nine years old and they're already playing, yeah. you know, Liszt, Lieberstrom and um, Fantasy Impromptu and, you know, La, La yeah. Campanella, which are the hardest things that you can play. Yeah. Um, so, no, there's no age, there's no age cap. Yeah. No. Wow, that's incredible, that. Yeah. I think learning a musical instrument from a young age is literally one of the best things you can do for your child child's development the brain hand-eye coordination like everything is just and it's cool creativity, you know it's like really yeah. amazing and, yeah, and creativity yeah. as well it's a super amazing thing to, yeah. to have learned how did you get into the violin like did did your my mom, mom and dad say here we go <laughs> yeah <laughs> you doing this yeah she was quite my mom's really calm now and very <laughs> forgiving but i look back and they were really strict they're super relaxed now but they were but it was like a perfect strictness and I'm really grateful. Like I just, I can't express how the gratitude that I have for them and everything that they've brought me up on and everything that they did. Um, my mum was like, she would never make me miss orchestra. She would literally drive us everywhere to every single, and there were four of us. So she would literally just make sure we were all on time to every single activity that all of us had to do after school. And, um, but they were super strict. She was like, no, you're going. And I don't want to hear that. That's the end of it. You know, yeah. like these are the kind of conversations that we would have. Like, Mom, I don't want to do my practice. No, you're doing. Have you done your practice? You're doing it. You know, yeah. they were very strict. Yeah, yeah. So how yeah. did you end up with with violin and piano? I think it was because my older sister played the cello already, and my mum wanted to have diversity in the family. Um, <laughs> and we had a massive we had a massive piano in the house, so it was it just figured that I would start playing and have lessons. In fact, everybody had lessons. The only person that dropped out was my sister. <laughs> so she was just much more gifted at dance. So my mum quickly realised that it would be dancing for my sister and musical instruments for everybody else. Oh, that's cool. So Christmas yeah. time at your place was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, actually man. didn't sing around the piano, no. But yeah, obviously it was I amazing. You got but... the celloist. You got the you know you got everyone yeah, you need there to have a. <laughs> we didn't really have concerts in the house or anything like that oh there it's you good, go yeah it's a good <laughs> next year yeah. and, and was you was your mom was she musical as well not at all my mom okay. couldn't even play the recorder she keeps telling me <laughs> oh, she was recorder. Right. My, my dad does my, my father's very musical and yeah. his mum was very creative and dramatic and musical 
so it is definitely genetic um but my father plays the piano um yeah yeah and my 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 elder sister's actually a piano teacher now ah cool so she's oh, wow. exceptional oh, wow. she's very good so we were all very musical growing up we were all yeah. played the instrument we, we all sang we all danced we all went on, on stage my brother's my brother's hilarious he's he's like you know he was an <laughs> amazing actor we all did theater school um yeah but it was my twin sister who was naturally gifted and yeah she was just yeah. incredible at ballet and dance and e- exceptional so That's yeah so cool. That's wow. so cool. and what you, an upbringing you, you, yeah you, you, you make it sound like the, the recorder is an easy thing to play like i can definitely <laughs> tell you <laughs> I would have no clue where to start with the recorder. <laughs> many, 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 a parent, yeah. many a parent hates like the, their worst nightmare is the recorder, like at school. You know, the kid comes in home my, and they're like... Honestly, in my school, it was, that was how you would start. You would start yeah. with the recorder and then you would move to a better instrument because they test your, um, I guess, agility, right? And how good you are. And if you're musical, just by the recorder. Yeah. And so they, they, they basically suss out who's going to be good and who isn't. And then they, they I think put, the they recorder, record. to make a nice sound come out of a recorder, you need to have grade eight music because I don't think it's the most beautiful <laughs> sounding instrument. It's not, no. But it's kind of, yeah. I see it as one of those beginner instruments, as in it tests whether or not you, you're yeah. going to be a good, you know. Of course. Yeah. yeah. It's like learning how to walk <laughs> before you can run. That's how I see the recorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Definitely. Yeah. So, so Rosie, yeah, you, you, like I said, you now have been doing uh, Miss Nutritionist for about ten years. Yeah. And uh, you know, like it's, it now sounds like it's a real uh, thriving business, mm. and you know, but the beginning of it was was quite hectic, uh, from what we what we know about you. You know, like you, okay. you had like a hectic uh, initial four years, mm. um, which uh, which led to you know, you basically developing a health condition called adrenal yeah. fatigue. Um, do you mind just kind of walking us through, you know, what happened in those initial years and then, you know, you know, your, when yeah. you basically fell down in a park and you're like, okay, something's yeah. wrong here. So, so like I said, the minute I graduated, I was literally a freight train. I was so ambitious. I wanted to have the biggest, bestest nutritional clinic. I wanted to be on Harley Street. I wanted to see all the celebrities. I'm very visionary, so I literally wanted it all. And I would stop at nothing. I just went for it. I just, I said yes to everything. You know, I would do anything to build my business. So, you know, I I was like collaborating with loads of gyms, seeing loads of clients, doing loads of talks. I started to develop my own food. um, I I launched my own food products called the Dynabites, which are protein bars. You know, and at one point, so what I was doing, I was running two businesses at once. I was running Miss Nutritionist. I was running the Dynabites literally did not stop and to the point where um i was not looking out after my diet i was definitely under eating but that was completely unintentional it was because my work came first i would put business as as the priority um i was you know um, not sleeping i was working to really late at night i would work saturdays sundays i literally did not stop um, and then thrown into the works was a lot of personal um, challenges. So I was with somebody for 10 years and we were engaged and we actually broke up and he moved away. He moved to Singapore. I got thrown out of the house and literally wow. I, ha- I had to start all over again. And I, I had to start funding my own life and, you know, paying all these expensive bills. And it just all got too much. And it's called the allostatic load where you have one stress that doesn't go away. And then you have another stress and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. And it takes about a three year period for your um, adrenal glands to start to get really worked up to the point where it starts to drop down. So something was the straw that broke the camel's back. And literally about four years ago, I was just walking in the park, just felt really dizzy. And um, literally my knees went from underneath me and I collapsed. I literally fell to the ground and I was quite humiliated because nothing, nothing like that had ever happened to me before. So what I did was I climbed into a taxi and I went home, literally called into bed and stayed there for three years. Three years. And oh, good three Lord. Years, three years. And I literally couldn't move. I was paralyzed with exhaustion. Um, I remember at my worst, I couldn't even lift my head off the pillow. Just turning Jesus. over in my bed was just exhausting. The thought of brushing my teeth, going to the loo, literally it just 
couldn't bear it. And I, I lost my drive, my motivation. Even Jeez. small tasks were challenging. I would cry the whole time because I was just like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I move? Uh, I had to stop working. I, I had to stop exercising. I literally would just sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. Like, I was a complete shadow of my former self. And um, it was so dark. Some t- at some points, I haven't really shared this with many people, but I literally wanted to just quit my life and give up because, you know, you would go to bed and you would think tomorrow I'm going to wake up energized. I'm going to feel better tomorrow. And then you wake up and you feel exactly like the best, the best way I can describe how I felt was, can you, if ever you've been hung over, right? Like super hung over and it's at the end of the day, it's the 11th hour and you're just about to take yourself off to bed and you feel awful. Don't you? You're just like, Oh mm. my God, you're a zombie. So it's kind of like that times 10. Wow. But you wake up feeling that way. Wow. You wake oh, up. Oh, my goodness. And it doesn't ever lift. And you think that having food will make you feel more energized. I'll just have a nap and you'll feel energized. I'll do some meditation and you'll feel energized. And you don't. You literally stay fatigued at this extreme level of fatigue for so long. And so it's really debilitating. It's the most frustrating thing in the world because you think, okay, I'm going to go to sleep now and tomorrow I'll feel better. But you don't. Yeah. And so this continued, this continued literally for three years. <laughs> and I forced myself to run my business. I forced myself out of bed. I, I remember so many times I would literally go to meetings to sell some products or whatever to sell my services because I still had to make a living. And I would collapse in an Uber afterwards. Wow. And I literally, I couldn't even read my emails, read my messages. I was so, wow. I would fall and then I would get home, literally climb, like not even take off my clothes, climb into bed and pass out. And I, I've lost count the amount of times that I had to do that. And that was my life for about three years. So, 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 oh, that's, so yeah, oh, so that's before, insane, I know, it was, it was, it? and I wow. literally wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. But so in the beginning, I'll just take you back so that you know what happened. Um, you know, initially, I, I hadn't a clue what was going on. And I was like, why am I so exhausted? And I, I did what anybody would do in that situation. I took myself off to the doctors and I, you know, I ran, I asked her to run some bloods on me because I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? Like, I, I can't move. And she said, oh, you're fine. Everything's normal. Your bloods are all normal. You're just depressed. Uh. Here are some antidepressants. <laughs> so I burst into tears. I was like, I'm not depressed. I'm exhausted. Yeah. And naturally, I didn't even take the prescription because I was like, this is not what's going on. And I went home and I basically did shit loads of research. And I, I, um, I did so much reading. I did loads of tests on myself. So I did the cortisol test. I did, you know, all these other, like the pupil test and the heartbeat test. And it was super clear that I had adrenal fatigue and I went to see lots of other naturopathic doctors and it was all barking up that, that tree. It was burnout. It was adrenal fatigue. And I was like really relieved that I knew what it was because then I started to heal myself and I literally changed absolutely everything. Like my whole life did a 180. I had to change my diet, my mindset and my lifestyle. And these are the three things that I teach everybody now how to recover. And I always say that if you're not changing those three things, you're not going to recover. So th- those are like the three building blocks to recovery. So I had to eat around the clock. I had to increase my food intake. I had to sleep. I had to be really um, vigilant about my sleep. I At one point, I was taking 40 pills a day, like 40 supplements, because when you're burnt out, all of your nutrient levels are really depleted. So particularly sodium, potassium, magnesium, B vitamins, and I did, I did a hair mineral analysis test, and that was a game changer for my energy. As soon as I started to take all these pills, my energy levels increased. You know, what else did I do? I had to cut out caffeine completely. I, had to, I, I noticed that I had a food allergy to eggs, and every time I would eat eggs, I would literally fall into a food coma, and that would make me even worse. Huh. So I had to be mm. really, really strict about everything that I was eating, everything that I was doing. I started doing loads of meditation, loads of yoga. I couldn't exercise anymore, so I stopped going to the gym. Um, What else? I had to change the relationships around me. The relationships that I had were extremely toxic at the time. I was in a really toxic relationship, and that was definitely not helping my recovery. Mm. Um, And I was on my own. Like I didn't in the beginning, in the first year or two, I didn't have anybody around me. Like my twin sister was in Hong Kong. My parents didn't know about it. 
I, I, I'm very much I kept it to myself, which in hindsight was the wrong thing to do, mm. because a, a strong support network is absolutely fundamentally mm. what you need to cover. So I had to get that in place. I had to hire people to help. Like I had to get interns to help me with my companies and my businesses. They were my hands and my feet because I couldn't move. Um, so yeah, that was that was really the hardest years of my life. Jeez. I'm much better yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, wow. really, that's a, that's a, such a, a such a wow. It's just amazing to see you like so animated and full of energy now. You know, like just hearing that story is is yeah. heart wrenching. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'd like to obviously unpack a few of those things a little yeah, bit because definitely. obviously there's a lot to it. Just taking it sort of back to the beginning uh, of your story, the I mean, we kind of we scoff at the idea that they said it was depression, but I mean, how different is depression to chronic fatigue? And what is the difference in the diagnosis? Yeah. And and perhaps uh, what are some of the differences in the symptomatology between the two? There's so much crossover. That's the first thing I'm going to say. So the symptoms that I experience with adrenal fatigue, like being sad, crying, feeling um, lonely, of course, they're exactly the same signs and symptoms as depression, right? When you're depressed, you also lose your drive, your motivation. When you're depressed, you have no energy. So yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand what the difference is. Um, my history was the reason I knew it was adrenal fatigue and burnout and not depression. So Gosh. I, so that's, you know, uh, that's how I knew that I was dealing with extreme exhaustion to the point where it wasn't just depression. Um, similarly with chronic fatigue and ME, again, there's lots of crossover with ME and chronic fatigue. You know, you're tired, you're dizzy, you get, um, uh, you, you lose your drive, your motivation. Um, but one of the main differences from a symptom point of view is that you get aches and pains in your body and you get headaches. I didn't get any of that, thankfully. So I knew it wasn't chronic fatigue and I knew it wasn't ME. I, I didn't literally, I wasn't bed bound in pain. Um, and I also know that the diagnosis of chronic fatigue and ME is very much, well, firstly, it's much more recognized and it's much more viral based. So usually you develop these conditions from the Epstein-Barr virus, which then typically ends up with glandular fever and then you end up with chronic fatigue and ME. So I didn't follow that pattern. That wasn't me. My mine was much more because that's the difference. Adrenal fatigue and burnout is stress related. ME and chronic fatigue is more viral and inflammatory and immune related. So I knew that that wasn't me because I didn't have sickness. I didn't have headaches. My immune system was mm. very strong despite me feeling fatigued and depressed and low. And, but again, it was my history. Everything added up. I knew that I was running around like a nut job. I thought I was superwoman. Yeah. Um, so I hope that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, big time because I yeah. think the fibromyalgia plays into that whole uh, ME, chronic fatigue. And so what I'm hearing is that, like you say, the history is so important. So for people that are sitting listening to this and they're going, geez, uh, you know, like, okay, so what, what is it now? I've got all of those. Mm. And I guess that's a big, real big thing, which I never really had thought about is mm. like really run through a long-term history of what led you to that point. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's really valuable advice for, for people to take. Yeah. And again, I know, I know we sort of scoff at doctors, but you know, when you're, if you're feeling tired, if there are people out there listening to this podcast and you're fatigued and you're tired and you don't know why, there are so many things it could be. So the first thing you need to do is work with a doctor. You have to go to your GP and get a blood test and find out, is it low iron? Cause it's just, it could just be that you're tired because you've not got enough iron. Is it vitamin D levels? Have you got significantly low vitamin D? Because studies have shown that low vitamin D alone can make you tired. And when you increase your levels of vitamin D, you can feel really energized again. You know, is it your thyroid? And if those things come back normal, then you go down the, okay, well, maybe it's adrenal fatigue. If, and if you've not got a history of stress, maybe it's viral. So again, you have to work with your doctor to see if you've got viruses. Did you have glandular fever in your, in your case history? You know, um, are you getting headaches and aches and pains? So, so doctors, we need to work with doctors to get those diagnoses. But um, and yeah, and so doctors' tests and case history are fundamental in the, uh, you know, identifying what's going on. Yeah, I, I, 
I, don't you think that you were, uh, in a way, you were lucky because you were more informed, right? You, you know, you, you had the knowledge. Um, yeah. You were like, there's no chance I got depression because cause yeah. of what you, you've done, what you've gone through, uh, you know, you're, you're studying. Um, yeah, and you're, and you're 100%. Going, so, so but, absolutely but 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 the problem is is like somebody else they would have been yeah. on medication for a few years and completely mis you know mm-hmm, diagnosed mm-hmm. so you're yeah. totally right and you're and i remember sitting in my bed when i was doing my research going gosh well i already know about the adrenal gland so let's look there you know and i had access to all these tests mm-hmm. for free because i'm a nutritionist so absolutely i already knew what foods to, i should be eating i knew which nutrients i should be taking and you're right, everybody else is in the dark. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are fatigued for years and they've got no clue why. They, don't, they have no idea and they've been to the doctors and they don't, everything's normal. And so that's why I want to spread this message and I want to label adrenal fatigue and tell the world that burnout is real. These are the signs and symptoms and this is what you need to be doing. So that's why, I, I, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to help those individuals that have no clue as to why they're tired all the time. And I want to help them to identify why they're tired, which is a reason why I'm, I'm hoping to write a book, guys, as well. That cool. that's, this is the purpose great. of my, my book that I'm trying to write. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. I think it's really great. You know, the first step is communication because when I started working – um, as a chiropractor in, in Holland, you know, from where I'd been in South Africa, moved to Holland, worked there, I started hearing this term burnout. And mm. I literally had never heard it once in South Africa. I'd never heard of someone getting burnout. And at first, I thought, you know, wow, um, you know, either these people are just soft because, you know, I've never heard a South African say, like, that's, that's literally what I thought, you know. And mm-hmm. Or, 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 but then I realized it, you know, that's just not possible. It, you know, people are silently dying on the inside, so to speak, and just not talking about it. And, mm. and cultures like the Dutch are very open. They'll say, like, I'm really not feeling well. I'll just tell you, and I'm not shy about mm. it. So I think what you're doing, the work you're doing, and a book that you're busy with and things is a massive first step for people to communicate about mm. what, are, what is it. And mm. it's okay to talk about, it. and then you can from there you can like platform that and and go wherever you want to go in terms of treatments. But I think that is a good step first starting point is to say openly what it what it is and and it's okay whatever it is you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like a problem. Was it a problem shared as a problem halved? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, Certainly. So. I mean, can we just just talk a little bit more about the sort of being in bed for three years yeah. thing? Um, because okay, so so like you 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 didn't have your network. You hadn't actually told uh, your parents, and you, I'm assuming you did tell your sister, but she was just in Hong Kong, or you didn't mm-hmm. tell her either. No, I did. I'm extremely close with Susie. I literally tell her everything. Okay. She she knew detail to detail how I was feeling yeah, yeah, yeah. from from the from the beginning but she was helpless because she was in Hong Kong for the first year wow. and actually bless her she moved back for me she moved back to look after me wow, wow. Yeah. so so she moved in with you or did she uh, have yeah, a, yeah in the beginning yeah wow. goodness wow. okay so 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 like so you 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 would wake up would you would you sleep a long time or were you not able yeah. to sleep a long time oh it would vary I mean yes I would get adequate sleep Sometimes I would get not so great sleep, but that would be six or seven hours. Yeah. People with chronic fatigue, ME, adrenal issues, they need eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. Because when you're sleeping, that's when your body is manufacturing cortisol, right? And the hours of sleep you get between 10 o'clock and midnight, they're the most boosting and the most refreshing. So anyway, yeah. So I feel like I'm giving a lecture now. No, 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 no
for the recovery of the of adrenal fatigue and burnout, sleep is absolutely the number one thing. It's completely paramount. Yeah. Wow. So so okay. So so like you you would some days you would be able to work for a couple of hours and yeah. then and, and what about yeah. the people around you that like say the the interns and stuff that came in like uh, to help you they obviously knew what was going on um, um or, or not really like didn't. what about your cl- <laughs> they didn't wow so no, this was something you really it. I really hit it yeah yeah and i only hit it i realize now for two reasons i didn't want to come across as weak i don't ever want to come across as 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 dependent and non-independent and i uh i um what was the other reason i felt guilty i didn't want to ask for help i didn't want anybody to know that i'm not very good at asking for help generally i think that's how i am naturally as a person i would feel guilty if somebody was like well let me come and bring you dinner i'd be like no 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 or let me come and i i I would like brush it away yeah so because the way I saw it was everybody has their own stuff to deal with in life right we've all got our issues why would anybody want to deal with my issues why does why would I that's just a burden I don't want to be a burden so that was my mindset as I was sick which was obviously not helping yeah of course and and putting even more pressure on yourself yeah 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 you know and uh, recovery is all about people helping you and not being on your own because loneliness is one of the biggest stresses and an emotional stress has a thousand times more of an impact on your adrenal glands than a physical stress so if you're feeling like you're you're suffering all on your own it's literally going to make you more sick yeah because it's a mental stressor and stress is why you burn out in the first place yeah wow jeez yeah. um yeah wow jeez it's uh, I, I just can't even begin to imagine yeah. what what uh, how difficult it must have been for you like like the the mindset is is such a big one too because like you said you're feeling down and it's it's really amazing that you you didn't kind of really spiral actually from that into depression you know what i mean like um it it it, it takes i guess maybe a certain type of person to not to not go down that path um, I mean, d- yeah, yeah, there were times, uh, you know, when I was just constantly crying and the moments where I wanted to just quit my life, I think probably I'd hit a level of depression there for sure. Yeah. Um, but eventually I did build up a support network around me. And if it wasn't for them constantly encouraging me and believing in the fact that I would get better, I don't think I would. I constantly had people saying, it's just a phase, you'll get better, you're doing everything you can, you know, you're not going to be sick for the rest of your life. If I didn't have that going in, I don't think I would have wow. drawn that up on my own. But I, I did, important. I tried to say, um, um, as hard as it was, I did try and stay as positive as I could. I mean, of course, there were days where I was just a bit like, if somebody tells me to be positive, I'm going to punch them. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> but uh, generally, I did try and take it with a pinch of salt. Even though it was extremely challenging, I did try and stay upbeat. I did try and have an inner positive voice. Um, and the tools around me, like doing the meditation, doing the things that make you laugh, playing the piano, doing things that are fun, those were the things that kept me positive um, and kept that positive mindset going. I can imagine what for someone like yourself, you're you're an achiever, you know, you were a really good gymnast, you played all of these instruments and I would imagine kind of what you mentioned now is a, a really, really tough aspect is like, and I'd like, I'm actually kind of saying it, but I'm asking the question as well. Did you, did you realize at the time, like, like I should be feeling great, like mentally I'm, I'm there, but I just can't. Is that, is that, am I understanding correctly? Like, even though you might've been thinking, okay, I'm going to get everything going, but then the body just wasn't there. Is that the kind of feeling you had or were you just also like, I'm just weak and I'm just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was that. It was literally mind and body were ruined. Like they would, you would never have one better than the other. Well, sometimes you would. Sometimes I would feel physically tired, but mentally I was, I was okay. Um, Or the other way around. Sometimes my mind would be quite bouncy, but physically I couldn't move. And sometimes it would be a double whammy where mentally I was screwed and physically I was screwed. And it was more that it was more it would come together at a very intense level that you're just like, oh, you know, you're you're worse than a zombie. Yeah. Yeah. And were your parents at this stage um, 
I mean, they must have known you weren't well. I mean, maybe you hadn't given them the full uh, details of everything. But what sort of, I, I mean, if you speak to them now, what, what did they think was, was wrong? Or what did, did they think you were depressed? You know or? what? To this day, I still don't think my other siblings and my parents really know what was wrong. And they definitely don't know the depth of how sick I was. And wow. um, so... I think they just try to, like the British always do, they just would ignore it and brush it under the carpet and be like, oh, Rosie's not feeling so good. They never asked me what was wrong. They never Mm. tried to dig deep and get to the bottom of it. I think they just thought that I wasn't taking care of myself. I think they just thought that I wasn't eating enough. Working too hard, you're not eating enough. Yeah, yeah. they definitely, I still think to this day, they don't really realize how sick I was. Wow. Yeah, but I would probably keep it that way because it's done Mm. now and... Again, I didn't want to worry them. My mum is such a warrior. I didn't want to have. I didn't want her to lose sleep over me. Bless her. Sure. I just wanted to do it on my own. And yeah. And, and do you think you you've kind of changed since that in terms of sharing uh, any other <laughs> issues that you might have? Like you know what I mean? You're like, oh, you know what? Normally I wouldn't tell somebody this, but I'm actually going to tell you because I, I yeah. know that I can benefit from I'm you much, hearing it's, it's, it's a work in progress I'm much I'm getting there I'm better now but it's, it's taking me a long time to ask for help and tell people how I'm feeling and reach out and um, you know if I'm not comfortable with something I'll say something rather than just you know yeah hold my tongue so yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. because one, one of the things that we find right like literally through our own discussions, you know, and just Craig and I talking, but then also through the people that we speak to, like, there are so many people that are suffering from the same things, like literally, you know, like, we all suffer from the same sort of thoughts, the same sort of fears, and and often like the same sort of physical issues, and sometimes mental issues, but we just don't talk about it. And it's so if you think about it, it's, it's so silly, because it's like this big elephant sitting in the room. Everyone's got it. And mm. yet we're like, no, everything's cool. Don't worry. I'm good, you know. And But but if we do actually start talking about it more, and it, then it becomes more normal, you know. So like it's like, oh, you know what? It's not actually bad to talk about this because there's so many other people suffering from it. So, you know, like I think I, I you know, personally, I just know that like, me i've become a lot better at sharing my Mm. issues um because i do realize that just by sharing it you actually help people absolutely and again i was watching another podcast last night called the power of vulnerability and she was saying that the more vulnerable we are yes it's tough to feel these strong emotions it's tough to feel heartbreak it's tough to feel pain but if we just allow them and accept them and not numb them and not block them we become stronger people and we become more confident and courageous and successful um, because we are able to deal with those 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 feelings of vulnerability. Wow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think yeah, being vulnerable and being open to being vulnerable and telling people is definitely an important thing. So, so Rosie, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about um, how, like how you, not only how you turned that corner, but when you turned the corner and like how did that happen for you? Was it just a gradual thing where you? had an hour of energy and then two hours and four hours. Uh, and how did you integrate yourself back into like a full work day? Oh my gosh, that's a really loaded question. For years, it was literally, I could only do about four hours a day. And then I changed loads of things last year, which suddenly gave me more energy. And then I was able to last longer in the day. So I, I call it these windows, right? My, my window of energy would increase and then increase as the hours of the day would go on. So initially, I would only last for about four hours. And then when I started to change loads of things last year, and I'll tell you what they are, you know, I was going for 12 hours without crashing. And I was like, and then, and then it would just continue and continue to the point where I was normal. And I was like, wow, I'm not even tired. And I could go to bed at a normal time. And so that, so so it was kind of gradual in that respect. And the, the, thing, the key things I changed last year would definitely, I did this test called the hair mineral analysis. And mm-hmm. that's basically you cut a piece of your hair and you send it to the lab and they measure all of the minerals in your tissues. And so when I got the test results back, 
I had low sodium, low potassium, low magnesium, slight mercury toxicity. And I basically took 40 supplements a day for 30 days and my energy really increased. Like I significantly noticed that I could, my, 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 I could last longer. Um, I started to eat re- more regularly around the clock. I started to eat more. I was eating enough, but I actually started to eat even more. And that, I think, obviously, that gave me more energy. Um, and I changed things in my lifestyle. So I got rid of some toxic relationships. I started to be more happy. I made my business started to do really well. So financially, I had more freedom, which was significant in my, um, you know, in the positivity in my life and, and taking away that stress load. Um, and I just had more fun. I just did. I just felt more free. I had more fun. I did. I was just laughing more. So those were really the key turning points to the point where I went from four hours a day to 12 hours. And now where I'm normal, I think now or 90 percent recovered. Wow. Yeah. And, and when you say ninety percent, what what do you mm. mean like ninety percent? How do you gauge because, that? Because it's not a hundred percent. Like I still feel tired when I wake up sometimes. Certainly if I get six hours sleep, seven hours sleep, which for some people is fine, that's a good night, like I'll crash in the afternoon the next day and I'll have to go to bed early. So it's still there. I can feel it's still there. And I definitely have down days where I feel low and I just, I feel like, um, you know, my energy makes me low and I have more low days than the average person. Um, So it's it's still definitely there. So I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying a hundred percent recovered, but I'm definitely rosy. I feel like rosy again. I feel bouncy and energized. And this is what I'm like. This is what I was like pre collapse. You know, I'm, I was born this way. I was a very, I'm a very bouncy, bubbly, positive girl. But when I was in bed, I was literally, you wouldn't recognize me. I was a shadow of my former self. I really was. Yeah. So, but I feel rosy again. I feel like I'm back. This is my comeback wow. year. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's nice to have you back, Rosie. So, so w- yeah. w- were you, um, like, did you get, like, very skinny? And, like, did, I don't know, did mm. anything change in your features? Or how, what does that yeah. mean? It's really funny, um, and I, I, I've, I think I've got a reason for it, but I was really thin when I was sick, when I was burnt out and stressed. And no matter what I would eat, I found it very difficult to put on weight. And I think it's because when your stress levels are so high, there's an extreme demand, and you need physical energy to deal with those stresses. So you actually need more food. And so you're, the rate at which you're burning calories when you're stressed, I think, increases. So I literally couldn't get enough food in for the amount of energy I was executing because of all the stress and all the things that I was trying to achieve. And so um, my metabolism was extremely high, um, but I was, I was very thin. And um, so I think when I started to rest more, eat more, take the nutrients, have more fun, enjoy my life, you know, get rid of toxic relationships, it wasn't one thing. It was all of those things. And I started to get back into balance again, and, and now I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a perfect weight. I'm, I'm very healthy, um, and I'm normal now. But yeah, I was very thin at the time, and I, I looked so gaunt, yeah. and my eyes mm. were really had such dark circles. I was grey, had very pale grey skin, yeah. which apparently is down to uh, adre- your adrenals. If your adrenals are burnt out and you're knackered, you, you get this greyish sort of skin color around your eyes. Um, so yeah, I didn't look very healthy. I didn't, I didn't look well. I looked gaunt yeah. and people would say, wow. people, people would say, you know, you, you look, I mean, to be honest with you, if I didn't put makeup on, I really looked ill. I really did. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I, I was, um, uh, think I wanted to ask you, uh, perhaps you thought the previous question was loaded, but here, here comes one. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, Modern medicine, right, is great for certain things. And I feel like things like this, there's a sort of a gap in the market, if you will, in terms of how, let's say, traditional allopathic medicine uh, treats this kind of thing, a chronic uh, sort of insidious uh, onset uh, kind of, I don't know if you call it a disease or, or affliction. Um, what is what is your, where do you 
follow the, uh, purely what the doctor says you should do and take the antidepressants, for example, and then take some of your own advice like you did and and or then maybe the naturopaths or the nutritionist's advice. Um, where is that? It's a bit of like a gray area yeah. with these kinds of conditions. I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not allowed to say, oh, screw what they're saying, and I'm not allowed sure. to diagnose. And, of course, I'm never going to poo-poo what the doctors are doing. Mm. Honestly, in answer to your question, I think take all the advice you can get. So get the advice and support from a doctor. Get the advice and support mm. from a nutritionist. Get from a chiropractor, from a, a naturopath. Get all of the advice you can get is, is really the, the long and short of it. Because you're, you're constantly learning. And if there's no way I would have recovered just all on my own if I hadn't to, gone to do these tests or seen a naturopath or gone to see the doctor. You know, So I think it's, it's, it's as much advice and um, help as you can get from everybody. And some of the onus is on you then as the individual yes. to to do your own research. Yes, because at the end of the day, we know we are the best person who's going to know what's really going on. Like, it's almost intuitive. We, like, you are the only person that's going to know what's, what really is happening. You know what are your, your triggers are. You know what's borderline. The doctor's not going to know that. So, yes, you have to have that intuitive. Like, and and... I was massively had this intuitive feeling that it was adrenal fatigue. I just knew. I just knew it was burnout. I knew it wasn't depression. I knew it wasn't my thyroid. Even before doing all the tests, I just knew. And it's that almost that universal intelligence, isn't it? That sixth sense, that intuitive. I don't know what it is. But yes, the onus is on you to um, ha ha have some input on that. On that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to kind of throw a spanner in the works here because I, I feel like not everyone is that intuitive when it comes to mm -hmm. their own health and lots of people do um, self-diagnose from stuff that they read on the internet and a lot of the time that is not right as well so you know like it's just it's just a tough one for people to yeah go research yourself and whatever because a lot of people go yeah no yes I've got cancer you know and, and it's like <laughs> but it's not you know what I mean it's like they I don't know they they've got like a really no. bad cold or something like that. But what can we do? <laughs> the power of Doctor Google it's yeah. there and it's it's um what's the word? It's abused. What can what can I do as a nutritionist? I can't no, just go yeah just yeah. I, I, just use Google. I obviously can't say that, but then I can't equally, I can't go, okay, don't not use it. Cause yeah. it, in some respects it is a tool, right? Of course. It's a tool. It's not a diagnostic tool, but sometimes for most people, it's certainly a start. And I think there's value in that. I think it's a start, Yeah. but from a diagnosis point of view, no, don't obviously don't use Google mm. for that, yeah. but it's a starting point. And if that means that it takes you to the next stage where you go and call a doctor for a diagnosis, great. Um, but so, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what else yeah. we can do about that. No, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, a tough one. It mm. is a tough one. It's it is a tough one. And it's always going to be there. It's always going to be yeah. tough. Yeah, for sure. It's up to it's each me, person. I think, yeah. I think if you get people in it's, and encourage them to do the research, but then maybe give them a few tips on how to do good research and, how, yeah. how do you search terms in the right way yeah. and search the negative of things as well? And, you know, and, and maybe that can just help a little bit and, or it just makes it more confusing. I don't know. So Actually, <laughs> it is tough. You've literally just given me the idea of a really cool new app, which is called <laughs> differential diagnosis. There you so go. you go into the cool. app and then you put all your symptoms and, it, and they say, it could be this, but it could be this. It could be this and it could be this. <laughs> so go to the doctor and show them that the, your symptoms. That would be a cool app. That's cool. There, there we go. There Differential go. diagnosis. Differential diagnosis. Love it. You guys, you guys have started a business out of the podcast. What a pleasure. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, Rose, like the, how common is adrenal fatigue? Like, you know, because I mean, my, in my, say, ex uh, career, I was an investment banker. And, you know, there, there's lots of people that are super stressed out and, um, but I don't, they never seemed like they were like really tired or whatever. But then in this day and age, um, 
the, the world seems to be moving so fast and everyone's always so yeah. busy and stressed out and all these yeah. sort of things. And I, I can only imagine that that is lean, leaning towards more people suffering yeah. from adrenal fatigue. So like, are you finding it quite a common thing? Oh my God, absolutely. So I definitely think that we are all walking time bombs for what burnout more and more. And that is because we live in an overworked, over overwhelmed society. And we are full of micro pressures every single day from the minute we wake up to the moment we go to bed. We have to check our phones. We have to do our Instagram. We have to do our emails. We have to look after the kids. We have to make their lunch. We have to get to work. We have to do these meetings. You know, these are all micro pressures that are stressful that build and they build and they build. It's that allostatic load. So I definitely think it's getting worse. I think that we're all um, walking time bombs for burnout if we're not careful. And um, let me share with you some quite scary statistics, which are... 37% of all sick days are taken due to stress-related conditions. Wow. Um, there was a study last year, 12.5 million work days were taken off because people were sick due to stress and or anxiety or depression. 12.5 million days in the UK alone. Wow. And I definitely think that's increasing. And fatigue and anxiety are the top two complaints that doctors see in their clinic every single day. So, yeah, wow. here we are. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, and wow. my personal statistic is I believe that every other person has experienced burnout in their life somewhere along the line. That's how I think it's wow. one in two. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So I think yeah. she said that's, um, I, I guess it's, a, there's a continuum and, and we're on this sort of continuum. If we're not careful, we, uh, like a, you can easily head in one way or another and your lifestyle choices are constantly pushing you either one way or the other. And it, there's kind of no in between and it's so imp important to try and manage those things. So, so I guess uh, maybe we should just discuss it. You know, what yeah. are the main things on, on like what to manage and what to look for? So I say this is a really good point because I, I talk about this a lot in my talks and this might come across as a little bit obnoxious, but it's something that I've absolutely learned and I teach, which is there's different ways to, to deal with stress because we know that stress is going to happen. We're all going to, um, we can't um, avoid it. And I, I say that stress is inevitable, but the mess is optional, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. meaning, and, and when a stressor hits you, there's, there's two ways you can deal with it. You can either react or you can respond. And by reacting, we're going to set off that sympathetic nervous that, oh, my God, you know, and I don't know if you've ever met those really stressy people that just are stressed out about everything. And, they're, you know, they're just stressy, stressy, stressy. So that's overreacting. Right. But the other way is responding. So awareness is key in dealing with, mm. with the stress response uh, as a first measure. So it's kind of like going, ah. Oh, okay, that's stressful and being aware and recognizing that that's a stressful situation and then just going, well, look, let's put it into perspective. Is it the end of the world? No. Is it going to change in time? Yes, probably, because everything is fleeting. And thirdly, is there somebody worse off than you? Yeah. <laughs> and so responding to stress is a better way of dealing with it and you do that by putting it into perspective and you practice it. You've got it. This is, this is something I had to get very good at and it's all about prioritizing and putting everything into perspective. So th those are the sorts of tips and tools that I, I share when I'm with, you know, talking to people on stage and in clinic and what have you. Is that the kind of thing you, you mean? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that, that's a really good yeah. sort of starting point. Uh, and then what are, the, what are the signs and symptoms that people can start looking out for in their own bodies to learn to listen to their bodies more? So for burning out, you mean the key warning well, signs? Well, like like I say, on the on the spectrum there or on the continuum, yeah. it might start really early before you burned yeah. out. You know, I think the key sign is feeling fatigued and not knowing why, and you're not changing anything. Nothing's changing in your life except you're feeling more fatigued. And one of the biggest signs is going to sleep and waking up after a good night's sleep and still feeling tired. That is probably one of the warning signs of you're burning out and you need to like literally pull on the reins and start preventing it now mm. because prevention is obviously key. Um, yeah. Dizziness, when you're getting dizzy all of a sudden and you don't know why, that's something that you've got to listen out for because, again, that shows that possibly your adrenal glands are, are struggling. Um, and, um, 
Yeah, I would say they were they were the top the the, the key ones. Mood to look swings. Out for. Yes, yes, yeah. and irritability. Mm. Having that whole you can't be around people because people are starting to irritate you, and you get snappy, and you've got a short fuse, um, and you, your cognitive function isn't as sharp as it used to be. Your memory starts to you know is is lessening. Um, th- those are definitely signs that you're overdoing it um, from a stress sure. point of view. Yeah. Well, that helps, that helps. Yeah, that's all like really, really uh, great advice. And um, I'm sure a lot of this stuff is definitely going to go into your book, uh, which uh, which will be really, really helpful for mm. a lot of people. But life for you now is really exciting. You're obviously uh, spreading the word of, of what's going on. You, you're doing a lot of uh, public speaking. Um, a lot of it from, from what I see is at uh, corporates, uh, big, big banks and other institutions. So how are you finding that? Like, how are you enjoying being in, being in front oh. of people and oh, I in love the limelight? It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I thought to myself the other day, if I could get up on stage and teach people how not to burn out every single day, I would. I absolutely love it. I just thrive. I'm so passionate. And the reason I've stepped away from clinic and now I'm much more on stage and public speaking is because I just want to spread my message to more people. Yeah. Right. In clinic, it's one to one. But on stage, it's one to many and that just is so much more rewarding for me. It brings me such satisfaction that I can touch, that I've got, I can touch people, yeah. so many more people at what, in, in, the same, in the same hour. And I just, yeah. I love it. And people are loving it. Um, yeah, because it's so, the other thing is, it's obviously so topical. It's so common. Everybody wants to know how to have more energy. Yeah. Everybody wants to know how to manage stress. Nobody wants to burn out. Everybody wants to be the best version of themselves. Yeah. Um, so it, that's why I get booked a lot. And I've got it, my stories really, it's quite compelling, but it's quite vulnerable and it's very real. Um, and obviously it's a great success story because I'm, I'm better now. Um, and so people yeah. are, are very much drawn to that, but I, I love it. I, I'm, and I'm hoping to do more and more public speaking. I've got a lot of gigs coming up this year. Yeah. It, it's, it's, really, it's really taking off. It's really exciting times. It's, Sky's the limit. Great. Yeah, for sure. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. And um, you must get quite sort of decent feedback, I guess, you know, like after the talks, I can imagine you might, people either come up to you or they, they send you yeah. an email and they're like, yeah, I really resonate with what you said. I yeah. think I'm suffering too. Yeah. Even yesterday I did a talk at Lonely Planet in the offices there and literally uh, about four people came up to me and just were like, wow, that was amazing. Like, not only did I learn loads of new things, I've got some practical information and tips that I can go and implement now, which is key. And everything that you were saying was a nice balance of being scientific, but being um, understandable and, you know, um, at the same time. Um, And everyone was just fascinated by some of the things that I was teaching them because it was cutting edge. It was new. It's trendy. Um, So, yeah. And that's just such rewarding, amazing feedback. It just keeps the passion going, keeps the passion alive. Yeah, totally. I can certainly see you've got a uh, that passion comes out when you when you start discussing yeah. uh, your subject. <laughs> it's really awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those energy levels definitely rise when you, no, when you talk like, about. <laughs> I just have to do a lap around my house to burn off all the energy after this. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny how like it, you're talking about adrenal fatigue brings you so much energy? It's quite a <laughs> conundrum. It's bizarre. In a f- twisted way, I mean, this illness has actually been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if it didn't happen, I don't think I would be doing. There's no, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I wouldn't specialize in burnout, and uh, it's it's needed. Yeah. You know. And I and I, I love it. I love inspiring people. I get messages from Instagram almost daily from strangers just saying, I love your story. I love what you're doing. It's great. Your message is awesome. Um, yeah, so cool. more, more for well, that. Rosie, it puts you in a very special position because you literally can understand when your people come to you. Uh, it's not a textbook thing. It's like mm. a visceral thing. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's invaluable as a patient. When I come to you and I'm, in tears or I'm really just feeling at my worst, I can trust you yeah. uh, or to, I can trust that I know that you know what I'm feeling. And I think that's like, that's the gold right there. Like, yeah. and, and so it's a horrible thing that you've been through, but now it just makes you such a better practitioner and a more relatable person on stage, you know? Thank you. Yep. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Walk the walk. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's it's really um, interesting when you look at people like what sort of influenced them in their lives, and it's often the things that the worst things that have happened to them, which uh, they grow from the most. You know, it's not like oh, this, I had this awesome holiday and now I'm like this amazing person. It's not. Oh, it's yeah. I suffered from <laughs> adrenal fatigue for three years and now yeah. I'm this amazing, smarter yeah. person. You know. Well, True. when 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 it's coming from such a severe amount of pain, you're never going to forget that, and you have a level of empathy as a result of that pain. And so my message is really simple: it's burnout sucks, yeah. and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Which is why all I want to do is help people. I just yeah. want to help them so that they don't get it in the first place and I want to help them to recover like I did. So awesome. it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. That's so cool. And uh, so Rosie, like uh, if people want to get hold of you, what's the, the best way for them to, um, to yeah. find out about you just to get in touch? Uh, just so you know, we put all this information in the, in the show notes and everything too. So, you know, just. Yeah, I, yeah, no, brilliant. I'm mostly hanging out on Instagram. It's Miss Nutritionist. I've got a website which is missnutritionist.com. I'm about to launch my YouTube channel next week. So it's YouTube, Miss Nutritionist. Um, awesome. I think that's everywhere. Cool. That's everywhere, really great. everywhere where I'm hanging out. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. great. That's, we'll definitely add that all into the, the show you. notes and uh, there will be links to all of those uh, within the, our website as well and what have you. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. So, so yeah, I just wanted to like, say thank you uh for coming on the, the podcast as a guest uh, it's it's really been so cool chatting to you, you know like and finding out about you and your story and what makes you up and also just for thanks to you for being so honest like about what you've gone through you know these are kind of deep things and uh sometimes you know like it, it may be a little bit difficult to talk about but very very important to talk about and I just loved your sort of like brutal honesty about all of it and uh, what you've gone through. And also the fun parts, you know, like hearing about tree houses as a youngster <laughs> and, and the really fascinating parts of playing music and, and everything like that. So it's been a really, really great chat, like lots of good information and some fantastic advice. And yeah, just thanks again from, from myself. And we really look forward to, you know, following you in the future and wish you all the success and, you oh. know, reading your reading your book when it comes out. These are all amazing things and keep doing great stuff and, and spreading the word and being open and, you know, explaining to people that it's okay to to suffer from things and uh, we all do. So, yeah, it's, it's really been a fantastic chat and thank you so much for thank your time. You. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, and just cool. briefly from my side, you know, I think what you said earlier, the, the balance that you have between the science and just being really relatable, I think, you know, keep that up. I think it's really valuable because, you. you know, I think people can just take so much from that. And and your honesty, you can just tell like how passionate you are about this and and people will really gravitate towards that and and get and you know you will help lots of people so keep up the good work and you you know we can't wait to hear how you go on on the ivory for your from the 9th of may that's really exciting oh, thank you. Uh, and so so all the very best for that as well and we can't wait to, wait to check you out on youtube so these are all <laughs> exciting things as well so thanks once again and uh, we look forward to a chat in the future Cool, thank you. <laughs>